Hi there, you're listening to the Practical Stoic Podcast with your host, me, Simon Drew. If you'd like to listen to over 200 episodes that were recorded before 2020, then you can head to my Patreon site. It's patreon.com forward slash Simon J. E. Drew. We'd love to have you there and any support is greatly appreciated. We'd love to also have you on our Facebook community, The Practical Stoic Mastermind. But for now, enjoy the show. Hi there, my name's Simon Drew and welcome to The Practical Stoic Podcast. Now, today I'm very excited. I've got an interview that I did with Harold Kavli. Now, Harold is actually from Norway and he's currently translating the works of Epictetus into modern Norwegian. Very exciting update. It's the first time that any classical text from Stoicism has been translated into Scandinavian language. Uh, And he's also the host of the Oslo Stoics meetup group. So really excited to have this conversation with him. And before I jump into it, uh, just so you know, I've got all of the links in the show notes to where you can find Harold online. Uh, And on top of that, I just have to let you know that we did have some technical difficulties with this episode. Uh, So I've pieced it together, tried to make sure that we give you as much as possible in as clear a format as possible as well. Uh, And also there is a point in the, uh, it was very amateur of me, I'm very sorry, but there is a point in the interview where my phone starts to ring. uh, And if those of you who are wondering, yes, the ringtone is uh, Big Popper uh, by Biggie Smalls. All right, you can all deal with that. Uh, It's a great song. Uh, But apart from that, (laughs) I'm really excited about this interview and I'm so glad that I got to sit down and have a chat with with Harold and uh, such a nice guy. And we're going to have him on again and again, make sure that we get the technical side of things right next time. But uh, without any further ado, I present to you my interview with Harold Kavli. You know, what was the moment that you realized that Stoicism was an area that you wanted to get into? Yeah, so um, I actually got back to university when I was quite old. old. Uh, I dropped out of high school and I, you mm-hmm. know, did ordinary jobs for about 10 years. Mm. Uh, so, and then I went back to high school to get my diploma so I could study at the university. Mm. And already, um, or even before I uh, started at university, I had discovered Stoicism. Uh, and uh, that was just, you know, um, very uh, just a coincidence. I was uh, just surfing on the internet, internet and I found a blog blog article on practical philosophy or uh, philosophical therapy, really. Um, Mm. So, uh, and there was a philosopher who wrote a very short piece about Stoicism. And uh, so then I picked up the meditations by Marcus Aurelius, and just just blew me away completely. Uh, Mm. I'm quite an anxious person, and, uh, you know, that ideal that Marcus Bryce writes about, you know, to be able to be critical of yeah. your own emotions mm. uh, or your own ideas, the way to try to take control of your own uh, mental faculties. I mean, that was just amazing. Uh, so, and I also uh, uh, I started, um, oh, I went to therapy uh, just after that. Uh, and that was a cognitive behavioral th- therapy kind mm. of thing. So, uh, and when when I got there, one of the first things that my therapist gave me was, uh, you know, like a leaflet on cognitive therapy. And the very first thing on the top was the quote by Marcus Aurelius. Uh, mm. So, uh, yeah, it's um, probably a bad translation, but uh, uh, it's, well, your life is what your thoughts make it to be or something like that. Mm. So, and that was about five years ago. And... Uh, uh, I mean, uh, it just keeps on giving and giving. Uh, hmm. uh, and um, so, yeah, about a year after that, I began at the university, got, got my bachelor degree. Uh, fo- I tried to focus on stoicism as much as I could and probably annoyed a few professors by doing so. You know, I tried to <laughs> in- insert stoicism in every kind of assignment uh, mm-hmm. and I don't get a lot of attention on the, you know, the main curriculum at University of Oslo. So, uh, but yeah, now I'm at, I'm at uh, 
trying to get a master's degree and uh, so I can actually focus now on stoicism uh, mm. for about a year and I'm hoping to work to write on uh, the sufficiency debate you know whether virtue is sufficient for happiness or not mm. so yeah yeah I love that I love that story and so w- would it be right to say that you found s- did you start studying philosophy at university because you found stoicism and felt like you wanted to further essentially the 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 you might call it the cause of stoicism in modern times was that did stoicism come before your your desire to study philosophy in general uh well that's certainly my mission now i mean i want a degree so i can you know spread this <clears throat> yeah. out to the world uh but i was a bit interested in philosophy even before that um you know, I was into black metal in my younger years, and uh, Nietzsche is sort of like the black metal philosopher. So I read a little mm-hmm. bit to him, but uh, yeah, I um, lost interest in that. But I, I think I always liked, you know, discussions on ethics and complicated issues, uh, mm-hmm. discussions on God and religion, and so. Mm-hmm. But I don't, I don't think that I would be able to get a degree in philosophy if I hadn't been so interested in Stoicism. You know, if I. Yeah found that uh great interest Mm. well we're definitely all glad that you have you know been out there studying and and you know getting yourself in order enough to to be able to now uh essentially yeah translate the works of epictetus which is awesome and and we were just talking before the show that so it, it's right to say that epictetus hasn't actually been translated into any of the scandinavian scandinavian languages right uh, not the discourses, at least. Uh, yeah. The the handbook has been translated into a bunch of them, uh, mm. but uh, yeah, not the discourses. So, mm. and, and that's what I'm working on that's uh, primarily. Awesome. Now, why Epictetus? Apart from the reason, apart from obviously, uh, the discourses haven't haven't been translated into a Norwegian. Was there something that drew you to Epictetus as a whole, or? Well, I like his style. style. I mean, he can be quite, quite vulgar from time to time, and it's very direct. You know, mm. he's sort of like a, a drill sergeant in the military or something like that. Uh, mm. A lot of, uh, uh, you know, tough love. Um, so, but uh, yeah, one of the big reasons is that he hasn't been translated yet. So there is yeah. a very good Norwegian translation of Marcus Aurelius, for instance. Uh, it's a bit mm. old-fashioned, but I mean, it's um, manageable. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it sort of sort of fits Marcus Aurelius to have kind of like an old fashioned theatrical of language, uh, mm. but that wouldn't do for Epictetus. I mean, he can be quite straightforward and direct, and you know, he needs, I th- I think, more contemporary language. Uh, mm. No, I actually really think that there's there's a real need for that kind of language these days, especially. I think people. And I've thought this for, for a little bit of time now. I think people are really uh, drawn to teachers and philosophers who will willingly point out their flaws uh, or, or will, yeah, somewhat forcefully point out to people that they're not being the kind of person that they could or should be and that they deserve better mm. of themselves, right? And I think that might be one of the reasons why Stoicism especially is is having such a resurgence is because it is a very practical philosophy, but it's also a, a, it's also a very no-nonsense philosophy. It's like it, it kind of speaks to the part of you that knows that you could be more than what you are right now, and it kind of rips it out of you and says, <laughs> listen, like it, it, it's kind of like that... You might remember the quote from Marcus Aurelius where he says, essentially, stop talking about what a good man is and be one, right? That might be the ultimate quote yeah. of Stoicism. It's like, just stop doing, just stop yeah. talking about it. Start living your life in the way that you could. And I might do a bit of a turn around here and come back to kind of your, your journey through Stoicism because I'd like to know what... What have you seen as the biggest benefits in your life through studying Stoicism? And and not only that, but you study it in a way that nobody else really gets the opportunity to study, which is like translating it into a new language. Like, how has that influenced your life so far? Oh, uh, 
it certainly made me more focused. Um, I tend to get more things done now than what I used to do. Uh, mm. It has uh, influenced me greatly to try to, try to improve my own moral character uh, and the way I relate to other people. Um, mm. So, for instance, I volunteered at um, the suicide hotline for some time, and I that's way out of my comfort zone, and I wouldn't have done that, I think, if I hadn't uh, discovered stoicism. Um, mm. I try to be kinder uh, to, the, to the people around me. Uh, I try to think more on how specific actions can influence my character and things like that. Mm. Uh, so, and it's made me much calmer. I mean, I have more control over my thoughts now than what I used to. And I, yeah, I'm kind of nervous. So I tend to have, you know, you know, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, a lot of, um, uh, well, have some, you know, uh, difficulties with, with controlling my own thoughts and emotions and things like that. And that's been a great help or a stoicism mm. has been a great help to that. Mm. I love it. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And I wanted to also discuss like, obviously you have a different perspective being in, in Norway. Like I'd love to know from you, what are these do you feel like there are specific issues or specific problems that people are dealing with in your part of the world that could be helped through stoicism? Because in, in you know, countries like America and Australia and, and, and UK, uh, we, can, we can probably identify a lot of issues uh, that we're dealing with in our cultures that could be very much helped uh, with, with stoic philosophy. Do you see any of that sort of stuff in, in your own culture? Well, uh, like Australia and the United States, uh, Norway is an affluent country, and uh, mm. the way we consume goods obviously uh, affects the world. So mm. uh, I, I think that that could be one area where uh, stoicism could be quite important. You know, um, maybe we should try to change some of our habits to, um, in regards to how we travel or we travel or how we spend our money or um, what we decide mm. to get and things like that. Mm. <laughs> no problem. Sorry, uh, I just so, got alarms yeah. going off here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no problem. Uh, so yeah, um, I don't know if there is any major differences between, let's say, Australia or Norway. Uh, mm. uh, probably isn't. I mean, I think that I've, if I had gone to Australia. Um, I would probably feel right at home, I guess. Mm. I'm sure you would. And uh, perhaps not in regards to the climate. And, and... No, of course yeah. not. But I, I also wanted to know, uh, I guess, so translating from Greek into Norwegian, what do you find are the biggest challenges for getting the translation as pure as possible? Well, uh it's always a challenge to try to balance the desire for having uh, a translation that's very close to the original Greek and something that sounds like, you know, good fluent Norwegian, mm. uh, especially when it comes to idioms and things like that. Um, and also there's a challenge that there are some terms that are very difficult to translate, like um, happiness or uh, eudaimonia, uh, eudaimonia. Uh, just say happiness. Well, uh, uh, well, then people get the idea that uh, well, it's uh, just you know like a state of the mind. I mean, like a sensation. Um, mm. and it's very subjective. So if I say that I'm happy and you think that I'm being honest, you must also believe that I'm actually happy, and and that's not the uh, ancient Greek conception of happiness or edamonia. Mm. It's more like an objective fact. Um, so that's a challenge, uh, hmm. but that's, that's why we, you know, have introductions and footnotes and things like that. And yeah. probably a glossary would be important too. Could we expand um, on that kind of ancient Greek de definition of eudaimonia? Cause I, I think a lot of people kind of translate into say the good life, right? It's, it's like, 
um, you know, kind of a mixture of, of joy, but also fulfillment and meaning. And, you know, uh, it's, it's not necessarily just happiness. What, what have you found to be the most pure definition of, of, of eudaimonia through, through your study? I actually like, well, in English, I like flourishing. Um, yeah. Okay. So, uh, I mean, there are some people who take issue with that, but I, I think that's, um, actually very good. Uh, in Norwegian, it's a bit easier actually, uh, since the, you know, the word for happiness in Norwegian would be lift. That can also be a, a verb uh, or lykkes, which means to succeed, really. Hmm. Uh, and uh, I think that brings us a bit closer, since edamonia is more or less to succeed as what what you are, you know. So yeah. uh, to have edamonia, to be edamonic, that means to you know succeed at being a human, uh, hmm. to fulfill your function, and to get the right right understanding of the world in which you live. Hmm. So. Now, yeah, that's actually something that I've been really thinking about lately. The the stoic, uh, I guess, it's almost a, uh, kind of like a call to action to figure out what a human does, right? It's it's like, um, you know, the the ultimate idea of virtue for us as humans is to to play our part in the scheme of the entire universe, right? Like, what what is the purpose that we are here for? Have you have you thought about that a lot? And in terms of of how we should, I, I guess, dissect the the thought of like we should align with nature and we should do what a human does. And ha- have you thought about exactly what that sort of stuff means? Yeah, uh, it's a bit difficult to uh, flesh it out really well. But uh, I mean, it's a great thought, and Marcus really surprised by you know in the beginning of book. Uh, and write something on like, uh, well, if you have trouble getting up in the morning, re- remember that you're waking up to the uh, the job of a human being or something like that. Uh, and mm. that's actually something I try to use quite a lot in my life. Mm. Um, and I don't think that you need to have all of the details in order to be inspired by that thought. I mean, um, in some cases, it can be a bit difficult to see what you ought to do, but in others, well, you, you know it. I mean, mm. if you see it's someone who is struggling, then you have really good reason to try to help that person out. Uh, mm. and, it, and if you feel that you're falling out with someone, if you, you know, starting to get really annoyed at someone and think that that person is a jerk, then, well, that's an issue too. Mm. Uh, and that's something that you need to try to overcome in one way or another. Yeah. Uh, and of course, it can be that uh, that person really is a jerk, but I mean, uh, then you need to try to find some good way to deal with that, you know, hmm. um, you know try to talk to that person. Uh, and that's a constant challenge. And uh, I I think that I made some progress, but I am quite, quite a long way away from Mac. Look, as, uh... you know, never being annoyed with anyone. We, I, I was just thinking when you're saying that it's like we're we're all in some way like Seneca said. It's you know none of us here are essentially teachers. It's kind of like we're one patient just trying to get better, looking to another patient <laughs> trying to tell them how to get better as well. It's like, and that's that's yeah. one of the beautiful things about Stoicism to me is their their um, unwavering willingness to admit that none of us are perfect. None of us will ever be perfect, but what we can do is strive for that perfection uh, in every possible way. Uh, And even though it's unattainable, uh, I guess uh, the Stoic message might be something like uh, it doesn't matter whether it's unattainable, it's still within our power to try to attain it, you know, and so you do what you can. Um, And and that's there's a certain humility in being able to pursue something would you say that 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 is impossible it's like we know that we can't be possible uh, so we can't be perfect but the stoics teach us to live as a human should live and and in, and to me I, I guess what that means is to to constantly try and 
be the better version of ourselves that we know we could and should be in some way. I don't know if that necessarily is a definition that would, would stand, but um, yeah, I love that. What, what do you think are the biggest, cha- have you faced any challenges with stoicism? Has, has anything, even in your translations, has anything challenged you or has anything, uh, I guess, made you, mm, I might even put it like this. What are some of the problems that you might see with stoicism, if any? Oh, um, well, there, uh, there's, uh, of course, the problem of actually trying to, to internalize all these ideas, you know, to try to not just accept them on a theoretical level, but to, mm. to actually make them part of yourself and the way you interact with others. And, and from a practical point of view, that's the one problem that I have. Um, so when it comes to a bit more theoretical things, then, well, one problem with Stoicism and Hellenistic philosophy in general is that we, we don't have that many sources for them. Uh, so when it comes to the ancient Stoics like uh, Chrysippus and uh, Zeno and Cleanthes, uh, we only have fragments and uh, they've been preserved in sources that aren't necessarily very uh, um, very positive towards the Stoics, mm. and, such as Plutarch, for instance. Uh, and uh, when it comes to Marcus and Seneca and Epictetus, uh, I mean, they're all great. I love them. Uh, but they seem to be more, uh, well, not trying to really give a full account on the Stoic system. They're more like trying to, you know, I think what John Sellers has said that that what they're doing, uh, trying to do is rather to say, well, well, if you accept the system, then how can we try to, you know, internalize the system, um, mm. which is a very good project. I mean, uh, it's a very valuable thing to do, but mm. uh, uh, it is a challenge that we don't have more of the um, like crisis or, you know, or something like that. So, uh, and also some of the ideas that, that Stoics have are quite challenging to accept, you know, uh, like for instance, what I'm going to write about in my master thesis, um, the idea that uh, well, virtue is sufficient for happiness. Uh, mm. That uh, a virtuous person would actually be happy on the rack, uh, <laughs> to put it bluntly. Mm. Uh, um, it's also, uh, I think, a bit challenge- uh, challenging to see what kind of role God plays in the system. And uh, the modern Stoicist movement is quite secular and it seems like a lot of people will just, you know, uh, try to ignore that part and say mm. that, well, even if you do re- remove God, then the entire system works just fine. Uh, and that might be the case. Um, and I think that uh, there's a lot to work with in the system regardless of God. But still, the Stoics spend so much time writing on God. Uh, mm. uh, and to think that, well, if God is sort of like superfluous in the system, System, then why are they spending so much time in it? So, uh, mm. I'm, I mean, that's something that I would like to spend some time on later on in my career if I get one. Uh, yeah. You know, to try to figure out the uh, stoic conception of God and what kind of role we. Do you feel like uh, in the system? Do you feel like you've uh, thought about that enough that we could maybe discuss some of that now? Because I will be the first to admit that I really don't have a clear understanding of what the Stoics talked about when they discussed God. And um, what 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 is your understanding of their their view of like the metaphysical? Yeah, uh, well, it's quite difficult. But um, God is, if I understood it correctly, and, and I'm not an expert, uh, is something like the active principle in the universe. Uh, he is reason and reason is what more or less uh, uh, connects everything and mm. uh, and reason is also you know what's in us what's rational in us mm. uh, and that's a metaphor uh, that Epictetus used from time to time that God is within us and he, he might actually mean it quite literal too mm. uh, and he has this great, great quote I don't remember where it is but uh, uh, he says something like, well, you're carrying uh, 
a god around with you and uh, you're defiling him with your filthy actions and stuff like that. Um, so it certainly thinks that um, that ought to have the way we live our lives. Mm. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I'm not an expert and uh, even if you disregard God, I, I think that you can you know, find a lot to work with. Um, uh, I mean, uh, even if there is no God, um, there can still be a human nature, you know, and mm. we can live in, a, in accordance with that nature. But mm. uh, yeah. Uh, no, I think it's I think it's really interesting to discuss this because I think um, I think what's happening today is there's there is a big push towards uh, a more secular society. But there's, I think what's happening is there's also a, a, I guess a group of people who, and, and I would fall into this category, I think, at this point in my life, a group of people who feel as though uh, we don't want to move too quickly towards a very secular society because there might be a, a lot of potential value in the idea of God, at least, you know, the, the idea of having some sort of belief in, in, in a power that, that, um, is essentially, uh, I don't know quite how to describe it. I don't know how to qu quite how to describe, it, but I see what you mean with the, with the, uh, with the interpretation of essentially like, um, rationality as the supreme knowledge you might call it, or, um, you could even call it some sort of uh, like an energy source around the world available to those who are willing to tap into it, you know, like who are willing to take the time to to be with it, essentially. Um, and this isn't me saying that I believe in the Stoic version of God or I believe in the Christian version of God, whatever. It's it's just I think it's a really important discussion to be had. Uh, and especially when it comes to interpreting this philosophy, because the ancient Stoics may have known something that we don't about the, the need for some sort of supreme knowledge source or supreme being, right, in, in a philosophy for it to be fully embodied. Do you get the sense mm -hmm. that, that with your study of the, I guess your interpretation of, of the sense of God from the Stoics, do you get the sense that they might have had that sort of view of like, this is, this is only all valuable if you also connect it to this supreme source of knowledge or. Well, uh, it is a recurring theme in Marcus, Marcus, of course, you know, the, that idea about providence or atoms, which pops up, uh, you know, I think a lot about 20 times during the meditations. Mm. Um, and, and, Marcus seems to think that, well, even if you do remove God, then uh, you can still, you know, have, have the same conception of a rational nature. Mm. Uh, so uh, I, I think that it says something like, well, if uh, everything is just random atoms, then don't be like a random, random atom yourself, you know, mm. try to um, try to act in a rational way. Uh, well, I'm actually quite agnostic when it comes to that point. Uh, um, I think that ethics need, needs to have some sort of um, justification. You need to have some sort of grounding for the ethics. Uh, mm. And, uh, well, if you remove that, then it becomes a bit more relativistic. I mean, you can say, well, uh, for instance, uh, Bob is a stoic, stoic, while John is an Epicurean, and there's really nothing to be said on why one of them is right or not. Uh, mm. And I think that's a bit, to put it a bit too strongly, wrongly. I mean, you can still argue, uh, you know, whether pleasure can really be the highest good. Hmm. Yeah. You know, uh, or whether virtue really can be sufficient for happiness. But uh, I still think that's a bit dangerous to try to, uh, you know, removing the grounding for ethics. And, uh, well, again, I'm not really sure whether God is the grounding for mm. the stoic ethics or not. So, uh, yeah, that's, again, that's something I hope to, you know, get an answer to in, 
yeah. five years. So I, I think I can already hear, I haven't even released the episode yet, but I can already hear all of the stoic atheists getting very mad right now. But, but, but I think, I think it's an important <laughs> discussion to be had, right? I think it's a very important discussion to be had because I, I haven't heard a lot about the, and I, and honestly, I haven't studied enough, so that's on me. But um, I know that there is a metaphysical aspect of Stoicism if you study hard enough. And, and I think the question that I've been thinking about lately, very similar to what you just said, is it's, it's so beautiful to be able to say, look, aim at virtue. Virtue is the highest good. But then there's sort of like uh, somewhere that needs to be bridged there between aiming at virtue and what is virtue. It, it, it's almost as if like, um, if, if you just say aim at virtue, well, couldn't most people just come up with their own version of virtue? And are we leaving it up to the masses to essentially come up with their own version? And, and that might be one of the reasons why Stoicism is one of these philosophies that can really fit into pretty much every way of life, not every way of life, but you know, you can, you can be a practicing Stoic and also a Christian, or you can be a practicing Stoic and also an atheist and also, you know, an agnostic, whatever you are. Uh, and so I think this is a really cool discussion that I think we should be continuing a lot. And, and it might be good even to have you back on the show multiple times as you study this sort of stuff to, to have these kinds of conversations. Cause I think yeah. People are hungry for this at the moment because we're in, we are really in a pivotal point in history where it's right on the edge of a lot of people really giving up religion. And, and I think it's, I'm, I'm, I'm a very moderate on, on this kind of subject because I, because none of us really know what it means to completely give that up, uh, if that kind of makes sense. <laughs> At all, I, I get the sense that you're very much. You, you said you're yeah. agnostic as no, well. You're very much. Challenge. Yeah, it, it it is a challenge, of course. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, I'm actually a practicing non-believing Catholic. So, so I mean, that's something. I <laughs> Please explain. Up, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I, I used to be one of those uh, Richard Dawkins atheist kind. Mm people uh mm. up to the point where i began studying at the philosophy um, studying philosophy at the university um and then i realized that uh well there are some rational arguments to be made for the existence of god and for uh the virtues of different religions um and one of my close friends is a catholic uh, mm. so uh just for the fun of it i made a promise to him that i was going to live as a catholic for six months or something like that uh so i start you know to attend masses and praying and things like that um fasting during the easter um and it's a bit more hard for the most catholics so uh, i mean that's sort of like fasting on the medieval rules you know so mm. we don't eat until 3 p.m and no meat and uh, um like that so uh, and I'm still doing that, um, but I'm not a believer. So, mm. um, but um, I, I think that I might be what Daniel Dennett calls uh, a believer in belief or something like that. I, I think that mm. um, religion can play a role in sort of orienting uh, um, your life, um, mm. and and so can philosophy, by the way. Um, but uh, the great thing about religion is that well, we can actually attend things like masses and uh there are established institutions you know there are priests uh, you can talk to and mm. and and rituals and this is uh, i mean we, we're, we're about to get some of that stuff in the stoic community too you know um we do have a stoa in oslo uh, so you get that sense of community and uh, even if there is not us where you live you can still find people on the internet and mm. um, you know use skype for instance to get in touch with them mm. so yeah yeah i think that there really is a lot to be said for the rituals of religion and what they can bring for people and also the community based approach of of really having that closeness between people um and and you know people who are listening to this right now 
I, I just want to reassure you that I, I'm not really making a statement on any end here. I'm not necessarily saying that Stoicism is perfect without a belief in God. I'm not saying that it's it, it's it's perfect with a belief in God. I I guess I think it's a, it's an important discussion to be had and. And I'd like to ask you what what have you found, uh, Harold, to be the have you found to be the benefits of going back to a you might say a a life of belief, not necessarily believing, but what have what have you found to be the benefits of those traditions and those and those rituals that you take part in? Well, uh, there is a certain kind of routine that you get from it, you know. Um, so uh, every Catholic mass starts with uh, the confession of sins, and uh, there's a little short moment the priest or before the congregation actually starts to recite that, you know, part of the liturgy. Uh, and in that pause, it's a great opportunity to to actually reflect on well, what kind of stupid stuff have I done in the mm. last week. Uh, and, uh, so, but I mean, that's uh, also the evening meditation. You know, there's a very close uh, resemblance between uh, something like in uh, prayer in the before you go to bed, uh, and uh, and the evening meditation that Seneca writes about amongst mm. other people. Um, so yeah, that might be a good place to to pick up as well. Have you found other similarities between, say, the philosophy behind Catholicism or the rituals behind Catholicism and the philosophy and rituals of, of, of Stoicism? Like, what, what other similarities have you found? Well, uh, I mean, that's uh, very similar. Uh, like, Catholics have saints and Stoics have role models. Uh, mm. You know, other people that you try to... Uh, yeah, uh, emulate, try to be closer to. Hmm. Uh, there are, of course, uh, the same conception that there is a way humans ought to be, that it's not simply, uh, you know, uh, up to you, you know, to try hmm. to uh, discover your own right and wrong. Um, but that there actually is something that's objective about uh, morality and mm. that you ought to understand it and study it. Uh, and then, of course, there are great differences too, and I think that the biggest difference, um, and, and this is actually what Christians criticize the Stoics for uh, in the early modern period, um, is that the Stoics think that you can be completely good without an act of God, you know, you don't need God to save you, so to speak. Mm. Uh, uh, and also, um, there is no conception of the afterlife uh, in Stoicism. Mm. They do talk about it here and there, but I mean, uh, uh, not nearly to the same extent as in the Bible. Yeah. Or, uh, not enough for it to be a core principle or any sort of like, like yeah, main idea. Yeah, mm. yeah and, and main aim, and the main aim in Christianity to be saved, you know, and uh, that's not part of Stoicism to mm. that extent. Um, so, mm. but yeah, uh, the sense of community and objective morality uh, and ideals, I mean, that's that seems to be um, common between them. Mm. Yeah, I love it. Now, I appreciate you sharing that. I think I think this has been a cool discussion on on uh, and it's, it's a discussion that I think we need to keep on going. Like I, I would love to keep on talking about this sort of stuff with you, uh, because I, I feel like I'm actually drawn to that sort of, uh, that sort of, uh, way of thinking as well. Not necessarily that there's a, a supreme importance in a belief in God, but there might be importance in the rituals behind the beliefs in, in a God uh, that that really are holding our societies together in one way or another. And also, uh, what I'd be really interested in is to discuss how we can can bring those kinds of rituals, the best the the best of religion, what they bring to communities, and see if we can create that sort of landscape within Stoicism, a landscape that allows people to have a community and to to feel like they belong to 
essentially a group of people who are, uh, are there to help and, and a group of people who are there to uh, lift each other up um, on, on the path of life, which is, it sounds cheesy, but, you know, life is a tough thing. We need community on, on pretty much every level. Um, but, uh, yeah, Harold, I, w- I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today and just and, and sharing your, your wisdom with us and, and insights. And um, I, I want to have you back as many times as possible. But did you have anything that you wanted to, to share with the audience before we head, head off? Uh, no, I'd like to thank you for inviting me. Of really course. fun and interesting. And, uh, uh, you know, after you invite me to, to uh, uh, appear here, I actually checked out your podcast and it's really good stuff there. So, uh, uh, yeah. Awesome. All right. I'll well, thanks so much, Harold. Yeah, I appreciate it. All right, so there you have it, my interview with Harold Kavli. Now, uh, I really hope you enjoyed that as much as I did and we want to have him back as many times as possible and make sure you reach out, let him know how much you appreciate him coming on the show and show him some support for the amazing work that he's doing translating Epictetus into Norwegian. Such a great thing to do and, and, and it's going to spread this, uh, you know, the word about stoicism throughout the world. It's brilliant. Uh, but as I said at the start, I'm going to put all the links to where you can find Harold in the show notes. Uh, but apart from that, I hope you enjoyed the episode and I'll talk to you next time. But until then, hope that this episode has helped you on your rise to the good life. Ciao. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to stay up to date with the Practical Stoic community and everything to do with this podcast then just go to my website, simonjedrew.com and subscribe to the Practical Stoic Weekly, a newsletter that I send out every week with updates and all sorts of great Stoic insights. You can also find me everywhere online by searching Simon J. E. Drew. See you next time.